This is Great Britain. Over a third of our country is made up of mountains. And Scotland is home to the highest summit of all. It's a landscape of fantasy castles. Lovely. Do the monsters live here? <laughs> I'll try a traditional method of survival, the snow hole. Are we going to be cosy in there? We'll be very cosy. And where a little toil and effort can have magnificent rewards. What have you... Look at that! This was where Britain's mountains were first tamed for visitors to enjoy. <laughs> what challenges do they have to offer us today? <laughs> These are the central Scottish Highlands. The 1050 train that puffs its way from the Scottish coastal town of Malague into the remarkable scenery of the central Scottish Highlands seems gentle and rather quaint. It feels almost the natural way to travel there. But in fact, only a few years before the railway line was built, this was outlaw country. Quite frankly, mountains have always meant trouble. You think of mountain men or hillbillies, the authorities have always struggled to control them. 200 years ago, these were Britain's badlands. Inhabited, so the central authorities thought, by little more than savages. Today, this train is full of day trippers on a bit of a jolly, and they're threatened by no more than overpriced souvenirs. Let me have a look. So this is the West Highland yeah. Railway, Ben Nevis, Scotch Whiskey. Fantastic. There's not much left to tell us that the place we're arriving at, after our three-hour journey, was once a military outpost, except the name. Because this is Fort William. It was built in the early 1800s as a garrison town to control the unruly peoples of the Highlands. Nowadays, it's a barracks for holidaymakers, drawn here by Britain's biggest mountain, Ben Nevis. Their guidebooks may tell them that Ben Nevis means the mountain closest to heaven, but some experts believe that the Gallic name is more likely to translate as Mountain of Dread. For generations, the slopes of giant mountains like the Ben were as fearsome as the people who lived amongst them. But today, this place is almost a playground. I told a friend I was going up it, and she said, oh, yeah, but Nevis, I think I pushed a baby buggy up there once. So it's not considered the most arduous of climbs. In fact, 100,000 visitors a year toddle up to its summit 4,406 feet in the air. All they have to do is follow the zigzag path winding all the way up its slope, and as long as you go at your own pace, pretty much anyone can do it. Someone even drove a motor car to the summit in 1911, so the mountain of dread is easy peasy. Unless, of course, you run up it. Morag, Emmy and Nikki are in training. They run the bend most weekends, and today, I'm going with them. Now, girls, you need quite strong thighs, quite dare I say, yeah, to do this, do, do you? Guess, yeah. It builds up with time, you build up your training. Lung like capacity. capacity. Oh, yes, oh lung, lung capacity. But this is more like sort of doing a gymnastic exercise than going for a run, isn't it? It is, going... on the way down, yes. It's it's ascending is, uh, it's, it's tricky. It's very yeah. tricky. What do I do about the pain? Do you take tablets before you go? No, <laughs> no, no. no. It's a, a drug-free thing. A wee whiskey. We have a pint at the end. The annual Ben Nevis race was established in 1938. I've been let off lightly with what they call a half Ben. So I'm going to be due a half pint, even if it half kills me. So you don't do the tanning lotion either, I see. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes me feel better. That's right. okay. Horrible. Perhaps if I fell over and banged my head now, I wouldn't have to go. <laughs> and who's got the phone? Who's got the phone for ringing the ambulance? I've got one. Oh, you I have good. I've got phones. Oh, but Right, you ready? Yes. Can we time this? Yes, please. Let's go. So, OK, I've got 50 minutes to get to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> 
so, all I have to do is trot halfway up the highest mountain in Britain to a large pond called the Halfway Lochen. That's at 2,200 feet. And if I can do it in under an hour, then I get a reward. I'll qualify to do the whole lot in a proper race. Don't you think that this is really relentlessly manly too much of this outdoor sport? Well, I don't find it manly. I find it romantic. Romance made me do it. Did I it? Followed my Why? husband into the Ben race. And he, always... he did it first, or had he oh, always yeah, done no, it? No, he's done a few. Yeah. And he always tries to find me on the bench, see that he can give me a snotty kiss. Well, I'm sure it's worth a snotty kiss. But hey, I'm fit. I run around Regent's Park with my dog. But after 20 minutes of this punishing stuff, I'd happily take mouth to mouth from my Labrador. And she's an iron man. I, I can't do it. I'm dying. <sighs> Oh, God. 90% of it is just staggering. Up. After another 20 minutes, I've lost my will to breathe. I'm being overtaken by people walking to the top. Yep, I'm just one amongst many having fun on the mountain. Fun runs, fun walks, fun even carrying a keg of ale to the summit. That's it, bear. <laughs> Just a few more agonizing steps and I'm there, halfway. Did I make it in under an hour or did it really take the six weeks it felt like? I once went pony trekking and as we got to the hill the horse started going ah, 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 oh, ah, oh, for the next six hours and I felt I'm killing this horse <laughs> so now the horse has had its revenge yeah, you know what it's like, <laughs> no, I know what it's like. Yeah. you did your 43 minutes 43 yeah. so if I were prepared to throw my off the edge of this cliff and roll back down to the bottom, you I'd have done do the it. half bend. That's my fastest time. Good. <laughs> you yeah. animal. Is it? Yeah. 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 Here's well, the two other quid. Okay. Fastest time. Yeah. Oh, thanks for watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a view. Look at that. Lord grab butt. Well, I needed a breather. This is my reward. I can see most of Scotland and my thighs have grown to the size of pumpkins. The girls are on the way back down, but I decide to plow on and see if I can make it to the summit. Uh, Off with the running uh, shoes, on uh, with the sturdy boots uh, and all the other sensible walking kit. Uh, Hi, what race are you in? Three peaks, short race. Short race. Good luck. No, well, I've done my bit for today. And I'm glad I got my kit back on. Out of nowhere, a storm roars in, bringing 70 mile an hour winds that threaten to hurl me off the peak. With 14 foot of rainfall on this mountain every year, you can see why, until recently, people needed a definite purpose to come up here at all. 200 years ago, the only people who really came up mountains were scientists exploring them like, like they were new countries. The path that's behind me here was built not to enable tourists to get up and down, but to enable a man to ride a pony to the top to make observations about the weather, which, as you can see, is changeable. This intrepid man was called Clement Rag, and I'm beginning to understand why he was quickly nicknamed Inclement Rag. He and his pony made the trip every day for two years, whatever the conditions, in order to send weather reports back to Glasgow. He petitioned to have a weather station built at the very top of the mountain, and it finally opened in 1883, thanks to sponsors who included Queen Victoria. Three men lived here permanently, 
as if it were a station in Antarctica. And they took hourly readings 365 days of the year, battling gallons of rain and towers of ice. In 1904, though, the observatory was abandoned. And Clement? Well, he would have certainly ploughed on today, but not me. Local wisdom has it, there's just a one in three chance of the bend being clear enough to actually get a view from the summit. But if you are lucky enough to get that break, there's still some evidence of the observatory to be found up there. You can take a breather amongst the crumbling ruins and look out on the extraordinary vistas. To the scientists who first set foot up here, this must have felt like a whole new world. From the tourist path of the Ben to the A82, I've come 16 miles south of Ben Nevis to Glen Coe to look for the evidence of how the taming of the mountain regions began. Glen Coe is known as the gateway to the highlands. This five mile stretch of highway cuts through a valley so exquisite it's difficult to keep your mind on the road. I absolutely love driving through the highlands. You get these incredible roads, brilliant scenery, and hardly any speed cameras at all. But I don't suppose half the people who come up here at the weekend and bomb around on motorcycles have any idea how inaccessible these hills once were. 300 years ago, to get past these towering mountains, Bukul Etiv Moor, Bidian Nambian, you went through bog, crossed rivers, and traversed moors. And to get where? To yet more mountains, inhabited by marauding, unruly Scottish tribes. <laughs> 